Barbillion is real, and it is spectacular. Yes, hello and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where today is the day that Barbie joins the Billion Dollar Club. This is the first film directed solely by a woman. There have been a couple of director combos that have involved a woman, but here, just Greta Gerwig. Uh, and that is far from saying just Ken, but she is the first woman to solely direct a film that has joined the Billion Dollar Club. And this is also the first billion dollar movie for Margot Robbie. As the film's producer, she pitched it as a billion dollar film. You gotta say what you gotta say in the room to make it happen, but it came true. How boss is that? And also, I think it's fascinating that for all her DC work, this is her first billion dollar picture. And Ryan Gosling, maybe he's no longer box office poison. Will this totally turn his career around? I mean, even Margot Robbie, you know, a couple of people over the weekend were like, oh, everybody said Margot Robbie wasn't a movie star. Well, she wasn't. She couldn't deliver box office. Neither could Ryan Gosling. Uh, but he wasn't getting the kind of work that Margot Robbie was. Uh, but she, now she has. Now she is a legit, I think not only star, at least, you know, I mean, you have to do it more than once to really become a movie star. But I will say she's a billion dollar producer because she put this movie together. She picked Greta Gerwig. You know, she, she pitched it. She did everything. And that is very commendable. And so that credit is a thousand percent earned and very exciting. Uh, so I, I think that that's something also I would like, I think that would be great if the industry focused on not just women stars and directors, but how about producers who can make a project, project like this happen? Uh, Barbie is only the, and not a lot of these projects do happen because Barbie is only the fourth female centric film to make the Billion Dollar Club. And there are a lot of movies in the Billion Dollar Club at this point. In fact, we've started the $2 billion club. Uh, and it's actually the fifth if you count Titanic. Should we count Titanic? I was on the line about that. It has an awful lot of destruction in it and it is about history. And you know, James Cameron is a very masculine filmmaker but at the same time, female Leonardo DiCaprio fans are the, one that's, the ones that drove that film's repeat business. So I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to put it as a female-centric film. But anyway, speaking of giving credit where credit is due, over the past week or so, you might have seen it yourself on social media, some sites have been celebrating a billion dollars for Barbenheimer. You know, before today, they were like, Barbenheimer has made a billion. And a couple of Barbie fans countered that this is not a group project. And some of you felt maybe it was. So that's another interesting question for you. I would say that on the one hand, both films, as we've discussed, have certainly helped each other out. The phenomenon was a part of both films' success. But if Oppenheimer were the film that for the past week had been closing in on a billion, would Barbie really have brought, been brought into that conversation? Maybe a little, but I don't think to the same degree. So while it's great that both films are thriving, um, make no mistake that only one of them made a billion dollars, and that one was Barbie. Is Barbie. Oh, it's so great. Now, Oppenheimer is doing very well, but it's unlikely to hit a billion. In fact, I still feel very good about my last projection last weekend, which is anywhere from 650 to 800, which would be right in Nolan's sweet spot for non-Batman movies. You know, he didn't, he didn't break the mold, but, you know, he performed as expected, which is important to do if he wants to make another of these movies, and he most certainly will. Uh, but, you know, let's keep it positive. Let's be positive like Barbie. We're not pulling any movies down, but we know that includes not pulling down Barbie's singular billion-dollar accomplishment. But this was a great weekend at the movies. You know, it was the first weekend of August. Typically, there's a big blockbuster that will open the first weekend of August. It's considered a prime release date. Uh, but because all these four movies are together, we still found ourselves having a party. In fact, now it's a pizza party. Mmm, pizza. Now, as much as we'd like to, we can't eat pizza all the time. But doesn't eating healthy take too much time and money? Not with HelloFresh, who is sponsoring this week's episode of Movie Math. These delicious and nutritious meals are delivered right to your door with fun and clear instructions that make them easy to cook in about 30 minutes or less. And talk about variety. There are so many different meals to choose from. Plus, you can decide if you want to focus on meat and veggies, fit and wholesome, quick and easy, or more. Tonight, you could be eating roasted garlic and mushroom flatbreads, sweet and spicy chicken mashed potato bowl, or like me, 
pecan crusted chicken with lemony apple salad. Oh, it was so good and so easy to make. It's healthy, delicious, and 25% cheaper than takeout. After a long day of videos, let me tell you, it feels great to be able to sit down to a home cooked meal without it taking until 10 p.m. to be able to eat it. It was so good and so easy to make. And it turned out pretty good too. Wow, this is a picture I am proud of. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code 50BeyondTrailer at checkout to get 50% off and free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com and use code 50BeyondTrailer at checkout to get, you heard me right, 50% off and free shipping. Uh, the link is down below in the video description. And thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. So yes, while Barbie easily took first place, as predicted for the third week in a row, we'll talk more about Barbie in this video, don't worry. Our Barbie party is not over. But first I wanna talk about the new movies that entered the marketplace. Cause hooray, they didn't fizzle and die. <laughs> All right, so anyway, uh, The Meg 2, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Oppenheimer, also as predicted, were in a tight race for the rest of the top four. With surprise, the Megalodon outswimming the atomic bomb for second place. Ooh, and while Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had to settle for fourth, that's which is sad because of the three of those, I feel it's the best film, although I didn't see the Meg 2. Um, it did open on Tuesday afternoon, as you might recall, with Showtime starting like at two in the afternoon. And it's up to 43 overall since then. Uh, so hopefully with strong, a very strong critic score and audience scores, phenomenal scores across the board, Maybe, it should, maybe it'll hold steady in theaters for the entire month of August. And you know, no matter what, it will do very well on digital and then Paramount Plus down the line. But why didn't Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles open anywhere near Spider-Verse? I mean, they're very similar films, intentionally so on the part of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And the film was surely hoping, well, that, not when, well, Paramount, the worst scheduling ever this year. Uh, but, you know, they didn't know Spider-Verse was going to be as big as it was. But, you know, then I'm sure they hoped they could maybe ride that wave. But why didn't they? There's another question for you to ponder. Share your, share your um, theories down below. Now, is it just, as I said, bad scheduling on the part of Paramount? Did the films open too close to one another? And on that note, Spider-Verse hits digital on Tuesday. Whoo! Just as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles will be trying to get some you know, keep its momentum and get some traction in the bo at, at the box office. But here you have a, that very similar movie with a lower price point and the convenience, because you know, it's watching it at home for a group compared to having to go to the theaters. And then again, the convenience of watching it at home. And if you buy it as often as you want, right? People might just buy Spider-Verse and say, I'll catch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles down the line on digital. And as I just said, that's okay. But Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would like to do okay theatrically, right? I just think that Spider-Verse release is going to hurt Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in theaters the same way that The Little Mermaid's digital release hurt Haunted Mansion last weekend. Um, it, it, it's just, you know, that's something else, you know, it used to be you only had to worry about scheduling in theaters, you know, what else is opening in theaters, but streaming and digital have become so prevalent and so much a part of the moviegoer or the public consciousness, let's say, that you do have to think about that as well. And this is, these are some real traffic jams. I hope if people haven't been thinking about it before now, they are after this. Now for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the diversity demos were excellent, right? No problems here. And the movie did very well with the 18 to 34 crowd. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles even did slightly better than Spider-Verse in attracting female moviegoers. Slightly, but hey, it's there. In fact, as you can see, the audience breakdowns for these two films are almost as identical as the movies themselves. The only difference is that Spider-Verse just had more of this group. Is that because Spider-Verse was a sequel? I think that maybe, I mean, hopefully for everybody who made Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that's the issue. Some of you might have already written down the fact that Spider-Man is a much more current brand that's been ongoing and has had other hot properties, whereas Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it's never been as hot as it was originally. And they, you know, they've kind of petered out the brand with all these stops and starts of, oh, this movie's okay, but then the sequel wasn't good and it falls away and then they bring it back again. Whereas Spider-Man has been enjoying enjoying, well, except for the Andrew Garfield year. Sorry, but it's true. You know, pretty consistent success across the board. So that's obviously probably a factor as well. But maybe it's the sequel thing, right? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is pretty close to the debut of the first Spider-Verse film. 
That's very encouraging, right? And maybe turtles, no matter how charming, are a harder sell than human characters. Uh, maybe they should sprinkle in some more human characters for uh, you know the sequel that they already said they're planning to make. Although, I, I, I mean, the reason they made another, made another Spider-Verse was because it won an Oscar. That really helped. Uh, and I think I could see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles being nominated, but uh, I'm not sure who's going to win the Best Animated Feature Oscar. But, you know, again, the digital and Paramount Plus should be strong enough that I think they will make a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles too, especially because the audience scores are so high and the critic scores. I think, they'll, I think they'll do at least one more. But I hope they're thinking about how can we even be even more like Spider-Verse. So we'll see how Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles does in the weeks ahead, but Seth Rogen and Paramount can certainly hope, with good reason, that they are building another Spider-Verse level franchise. And with all due respect to Paramount Plus, where this movie will eventually end up, can they get it on uh, Netflix as well? Because that's where Spider-Verse built up its fandom. Now let's hope the Meg 2 is satisfied with its mouthful of cash from this weekend because it doesn't look like it's going to be able to get another big bite, at least theatrically. The critic score is so bad, it's funny. You know, it's kind of funny. If it had stayed at zero, it would have been really, it would have been hilarious. And that was actually ended up, I think, being a missed opportunity. They couldn't be like, ah, zero percent. The audience scores are only okay. Not good enough that I think the movie can rally. The demo breakdown here is also okay. It's okay. Uh, so expect the Meg to swim to digital, digital waters very quickly, as Warner Brothers Discovery has had no problem copying Universal's distribution model, and this is a 17-day theatrical window movie for sure, right? Like in line with the Meg, C- I, I mean with uh, Megan, CB, Renfield, etc. Although, pretty sweet for Warner Brothers to have the top two movies at the box office this weekend. So yeah. Get the Meg out of there after 17 days, not only because it will be done, but then maybe Warner Brothers can bring in, fingers crossed, Blue Beetle. And will Blue Beetle unseat Barbie? You know, it's interesting. Three weeks out, Barbie still has a, a weekend of 53 million. That's very big. So one has to wonder if Barbie could maybe stay number one for the rest of the month of, the, of August. That would not be great for Blue Beetle. But it would be really great for Barbie, you know, because Barbie will continue to drop, but maybe the drops can be small enough and the other movies open small enough that Barbie can still stay ahead of the pack. Grand Turi- so what, what is she going up against? Well, Gran Turismo, Sony now moved that to the end of the month. So this coming weekend, Barbie faces just the last voyage of the Demeter, which I think she can take. And then again after that, Friendly Fire with Blue Beetle, which I think will be a little bit more of a hurdle. But I think there is a small chance that Barbie could remain number one all the way up until Labor Day weekend when, also from Sony, the Equalizer 3 will hit. I think that'll definitely be number one. That movie looks excellent. But for Barbie, ah, oh, that's like Avatar-level dominance. Uh, so yes, this Barbie has become a box office legend. Uh, this is the fastest that a Warner Brothers film has ever gotten to a billion, beating out the final Harry Potter movie, by two days. And Warner Brothers is already getting a lot out of that headline. They ran it over at the New York Times, so they're going outside the trades to point out what a mega hit Barbie is. Barbie also got to a billion faster than the first Avatar, by the way, which also took 19 days. When it comes to all the studio's movies, Barbie is tied with Universal's Furious 7 for fastest to a billion, with only a handful of other movies able to do it faster. And none of them is the first in a series like Barbie, because again, she did it faster than Avatar. So that's amazing. How high can Barbie go? Well, right now, Barbie should just focus on uh, Super Mario Brothers 574.1 domestic and 1.35 worldwide, because that's what she needs to beat to become the biggest movie of 2023. Then she can think about, uh, you know, toppling other box office uh, hurdle, uh, records and hurdles. But even before that, after becoming the biggest movie of the year, the really next big hurdle for Barbie is the Oscars. Uh, hoping to be another Titanic or Joker, big box office hits that still managed to take home the gold. Now, Avatar was nominated for nine Oscars, right? But it didn't take home any of the major categories. In fact, uh, James Cameron was pretty upset about how he was snubbed that year. Uh, and it didn't get any acting nominations whatsoever. Titanic, Leonardo DiCaprio was infamously snubbed, but Kate Winslet did get nominated. So uh, that's, the, that's the next goal. Now, when it comes to Barbie and award season, let's talk also Dune 2, right? This, this is uh, very interesting because we've already heard chatter about Warner Brothers Discovery potentially delaying Dune 2 to next year because of the actor strike, which, will, which would keep the star-studded cast from promoting the film 
including on the important fall festival circuit, which is not only to promote the film in theaters, but the awards race has already started at that point. However, Warner Brothers' discovery, even beyond the, writer, the uh, writers and actors strike, might also just want to give Barbie the space, as Dune 2 will be a strong awards contender as well as the first one was. The first one won, won a lot of Oscars in a lot of the categories that I think Warner Brothers would like to see Barbie take home. You know, that Barbie's best shots are in the categories that it would have to compete with Dune. So why make Barbie and Dune 2 duke it out for attention? And then also when it comes to money, does Warner Brothers Discovery, after they're not doing very well overall, they've already sunk a ton of cash into Barbie's ad campaign theatrically, are they going to pay for another big ad campaign for Dune 2 with the actors not available, and then pay for big awards campaigns, which are also extremely expensive, for both films right after that? Make this a Barbie year, and then focus on Dune 2 the following year. Uh, Color Purple might have a similar situation. So it might not be just the strike that causes those films to move. It could also be financial situations, and then trying to really focus on making Barbie a hit across the board. Uh, and a big new franchise for the studio. Will it be a franchise? We'll see. I mean, they managed to figure out Joker 2, and I think an, an Avatar figured out a sequel, so it can be done. Now, while Warner Brothers Discovery has is stuck making some difficult decisions, Universal is living it up with a banner year. They still have the number one movie for now, and it was still obviously their own new big franchise with the Nintendo uh, division, right? Fast X ended up doing very well overseas, you know, enough to save the movie. They have a ton of tiny little hits, hit, uh, hit films that do very well on digital. And they did right by Christopher Nolan, who infamously broke up with Warner Brothers after a decades-long relationship. I do think that there is a tiny chance, uh, actually maybe, maybe a solid chance, that Christopher Nolan will hate Barbie forever because it turned out to be the pink mushroom cloud overshadowing his opus in basically every possible way. But that's his problem, right? I think that he's been kind of a stick in the mud about this whole thing, and I think, it, you know, some of you have supported him on it, which I don't get. I mean, this is the business. They rolled the dice. They're very different films. And I think Oppenheimer would probably have performed more along the lines of Dunkirk if Barbie hadn't been there to make it a, more of an event. So he should be having a good time. I mean, how do you like to be Tom Cruise? It could be worse, Nolan. It could be worse. Uh, Oppenheimer is still one of the biggest movies of the year, and beyond the egos of studios and filmmakers and fans, right? Well, I guess you have to throw fans in there as well, because sometimes fans egg these uh, ego wars on. Uh, but it is a huge win for the mid-range drama, you know, mid-budget drama. I mean, that's amazing. Remember, Oppenheimer was made for just $100 million, proving that with the right combination of talent and subject matter and prestige filmmaking, you can still get audiences into the multiplex for a drama. That's so big. That's such a big win. That's so exciting. And as we've been discussing, we'll put this to the test very soon with Killers of the Flower Moon and Napoleon. As for the rest of the box office, while Haunted Mansion is still in the top five, that's little consolation when you see the 63% second weekend drop that it suffered. Whew, in a very weak year for Disney, one that's contributing to the Mouse House's current identity crisis, I think that more heads are going to roll over there. This could be their biggest dud of the year, theatrically. And I mean, we're not even talking about the Disney Plus shows. But theatrically, this could be the worst. And I don't think the cast not being able to, available to promote the film due to the strike is to blame. It better do real well on Disney Plus for Halloween. Although it's such a stinker, stinkeroo theatrically, that's going to affect how people feel about it as a Disney Plus release. Should it have gone directly to Disney Plus? Something else for you to ponder. Speaking of streaming, let's over to, head over to Nielsen for the first full week of July, where Suits has amassed an even larger audience in its second week on these charts, uh, airing on Netflix and Peacock. Uh, now, while the actors, again, can't say anything due to the strike, the executive producer of Suits is already going around teasing, teasing a possible revival. Season 10, anybody? And he's also saying maybe Meghan Markle would come back. I bet she would, at least for a cameo. I mean, if that 70s show's actors can come back for a cameo, I think Meghan Markle can come back for at least a cameo. And I think, I even think that wouldn't be looked down upon because she was a very big part of that show. It's not like she would be trying to get in somewhere where she wasn't welcome. She was a main character on Suits. Uh, do you think Suits should come back? I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. I would, I would look into it, actually, if I, especially if I were Netflix or Peacock. 
John Krasinski's final season of Jack Ryan, although I do feel the series has weighed down his career. He didn't quite jump to the movie star, maybe we thought that he would. Uh, part of that might have been that he wasn't, a some of you still think he was a good Mr. Fantastic. He was not, but uh, you know, John Krasinski, movie star, uh, director, or movie star actor, never really materialized, despite how good things were going there for a minute. But anyway, uh, he had to finish out his Jack Ryan contractual obligation, and here's the final season, doing pretty good when it debuted for 4th of July. While The Bear, three weeks after it dropped its entire season for you to binge, that was a good idea as it's still able to be in the overall top 10. Not just the original's top 10, but the overall top 10. And the only movie that could make it onto the chart this week, the overall chart, was Netflix's The Outlaws. That movie, it's been on top of Netflix's charts for the last few weeks. It's, it, it's a cute movie produced by Adam Sandler, uh, which is funny. It's a very Adam Sandler-esque movie. Uh, but it's amazing. It's the little movie that could. Over on the originals chart, ooh, Secret Invasion is slipping, even as it adds additional episodes. While Apple TV and Paramount Plus managed to stay in the mix, thanks to some of their hottest, if not their hottest, shows. You know, Paramount Plus has been able to get a couple of other shows on here, but Apple TV, not so much. I'm excited for Hijack to come on here, and let's see how that does. And if Severance ever comes back for season two, maybe that'll do well. But right now, Ted Lasso is holding up like this entire, that entire streaming service. Uh, their movies do a little better. Uh, then, so over on the movies chart, no big breakouts here this week though, even Nimona, with its first full week on Netflix, is still only in the middle of the pack. Over on Netflix's own charts, this is really interesting. Hidden Strike, which was stuck in post-production for five years and played in a couple of other, other countries and theaters, finally made its way to Netflix and did pretty good, capturing the number one spot. Uh, like almost no advertising for this, which just shows how interesting Netflix is. It's like in its own space with the way people watch it. Uh, but this is a US and China co-production, which, and I love this, highlights how Jackie Chan and John Cena not only both speak the language of action movies, but also Mandarin. Are they both speaking Mandarin in this film? Now, now I kind of want to see it. Did anybody watch it? Is it at least, you know, watchable? I mean, they, things really come and go very quickly on Netflix because the Gal Gadot actioner is coming out this coming Friday, uh, which we'll talk about at the end of this, uh, this video. But, you know, again, the Netflix machine just, you know, they have occasionally, they have like breakout hits, but for the most of the time, they're just, they churn. They, they just chew stuff up in the Netflix machine. It's interesting, but I mean, it's working for them. Uh, Netflix also debuted, speaking of new content that they hardly promoted, an original animated superhero movie um, that also did okay, although it seems to have done a little bit better than Nimona, which is uh, somewhat disheartening. Uh, meanwhile, they cloned Tyrone. We were wondering how it was going to do with its first full week on the service, and it's okay. I mean, it dropped from second to third. We'd hoped it would go up to first place, maybe, uh, but at least it's very close with second place. With shows, the second half of The Witcher Season 3 put it back on top, uh, while Netflix had some brilliant uh, uh, capitalization on Barbie Mania. This is wh where your scheduler does a good job. So they yoink, they took the first season of the 2012 animated web series for Barbie, stuck it on the service, and it did pretty good. That's fascinating. Uh, and I guess it was old enough that for some people it was new. Uh, I wonder what uh, Mattel will do, because, you know, a lot of you seem to be fans of Barbie animation, you know? So I wonder if maybe they'll try and bring that back with the success of the Barbie movie in some way. All right, so over on iTunes, The Little Mermaid and The Flash continue to get a reprieve on digital, particularly The Little Mermaid, which is still number one for the second week in a row. Is it on its way to joining Encanto and Moana as Lin-Manuel Miranda streaming Juggernauts? I'm very excited to see what happens to The Little Mermaid when it gets to Disney+. Plus. Will we see it? every single week on the charts like we do in Kanto and Moana? I think there's a chance. It's also very moving to see Pee-wee's Big Adventure still in the top 10 after Paul Rubens passed away last Sunday. You know, it wasn't just a small surge. It has, it has been in there ever since, and that's really beautiful. As for this coming weekend, again, as I said, Sony has moved Gran Turismo to the end of the month with a sprinkling of fan screenings throughout this week, and then I think also there's like one or two the weekend after, but it will open wide at the end of the month. So instead, just the last voyage of the Demeter from Universal, another one of those 17 day beauties, so if you don't see it, it'll soon be on digital, uh, challenging Barbie, Oppenheimer, Turtles, and maybe the Meg 2 in theaters. Then with digital, as we also discussed, Across the Spider-Verse hits Tuesday, while with streaming movies, Gal Gadot's actioner uh, hits Netflix on Friday. Can she follow in the footsteps of Chris Hemsworth, Charlize Theron, Jennifer Lopez, 
and John Cena and Jackie Chan. Uh, action movies do great for Netflix, and they're also have always historically been extremely popular in Hollywood because they have very little dialogue, so they're easier to dub and they have a wider appeal uh, overseas. Now, I know some of you are okay with uh, movies, you know, with subtitles and stuff like that, but you know, it just makes the movie have broader appeal and seem, you know, maybe not so much today, but historically. And you, but you can see the same thing happening on Netflix. It's just, it, it, you know, everybody can speak the, action, the language of action movies. So those films do very, very well globally. And that's why Netflix is so much in the action business. Uh, plus, uh, Prime Video has the LGBT rom-com Red, White, and Royal Blue. It has been a banner month for LGBT content with Good Omens Hearts, uh, Season 2, Good Omens Season 2, uh, and now uh, this movie. Uh, then with series, tonight, Winning Time returns as HBO's hot new Sunday show. Love the show. If you haven't seen Winning Time, start watching it now. You can catch up. It's an incredible show. So, so good. Uh, Tuesday kicks off season three of Only Murders in the Building. I already reviewed that. You can check out my review. Uh, the first two episodes will drop this Tuesday on Hulu. Uh, well, I think it's not as good as, quite as good as the first two seasons, but Meryl Streep is so good on the show. Worth watching. While on Wednesday, and so is Martin Short, while on Wednesday, the final season of High School Musical, the musical drops on Disney+, Plus. Apple TV has Strange Planet, and Netflix tells the story of the women of hip-hop. Then on Thursday, Netflix has Painkiller, and this one's really weirding me out because I like the cast, but this is the exact same thing as Dope Sick. It's the exact same story. It's also a miniseries. That was on Hulu. This is on Netflix, uh, but Dope Sick was also star-studded, and it won tons of awards. I only watched Dope Sick. I watched it very late because it had won so many awards, and I was like, all right, let me watch this thing, and it was incredible. So I just can't believe that they're, make, they're telling the exact same story again several years later, and because it's several years later, you would think that they would have had time to stop making this and be like, well, there's no following Dope Sick, but they're going to try. So, it, you, know, it, it, you know, no matter how good Painkiller is, it's like Love and Death and Candy. I thought Love and Death was, was phenomenal, but nobody cared after Candy. All right, then on Friday, Billion starts its new season on Showtime, but ah, Paramount Plus and Showtime are now the same service, so you get this if you subscribe to Paramount Plus. So that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? How far do you think Barbie can go at the box office? And how do you think the rest of August overall will shake out box office wise? Share those thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.